At the beginning of the 18th century, what is today the Trans-Mississippi United States consisted of three political regions, each controlled by a foreign power. By early in the 20th century, those areas were part of the United States and were broken into 22 political divisions, with the borders being essentially as they are today. The changes that occurred over that time are fascinating and are the subject of our Shaping the American West series of YouTube lectures. Period maps provide a unique perspective on this topic, for they show us the political situation in the country in, as it were, real time, as the borders were drawn and redrawn, even when the borders lasted for just a short time. These lectures will look, look at the shaping of the American West using original contemporary maps to help illustrate this complex subject. As we saw in the previous lecture in this series, during the years leading up to the Civil War, there was a large increase in the population of the Trans-Mississippi West, which led to a demand for the breaking up of the large Western territories into smaller territories and states. Such political developments were, however, difficult to bring about because of the contentious issue of slavery. This changed when the Southern states seceded from the Union, which allowed the now Northern dominated Congress to create five new territories during the Civil War. By the end of the war, the internal borders of the American West were very similar to those of today, except in the Northern Plains, where a large Dakota territory had a strange butterfly-like shape. This lecture will show how in the four decades leading up to 1907, the American West took on its final political configuration. The last major border change in the American West that was made during the Civil War was the 1864 creation of the Montana Territory. This was carved out of the northeastern part of what had been a very large Idaho Territory, which had extended across 13 degrees of longitude, around double the width of most other Western territories. It was both the unwieldy size of Idaho and the desire of the miners in the new mineral lands on the far side of rugged mountains from the political center of Idaho that had led to the creation of Montana. In order to make the newly reduced Idaho territory a more practical shape, at the same time that Montana was broken off, Idaho's eastern border to the south of Montana was moved from the 104th to the 111th longitudinal line. The lands south of Montana that had been part of the larger Idaho Territory were then reattached to the Dakota Territory, giving it that unusual butterfly-like shape. This odd shape for Dakota was obviously an impractical shape for a territory, so it was inevitable that Dakota would soon itself be reduced by taking the southwestern part of it and making it its own territory. Interestingly, this particular section of the American West had gone through more political changes than any other area west of the Mississippi River. From 1803 until 1865, portions of this section had been part of nine different territories. Louisiana, Missouri, Indian, Utah, Nebraska, Dakota, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Finally, in 1868, it became part of a 10th territory, the newly formed Wyoming. Running from the 104th to the 111th degree of longitude, Wyoming was created to have the same width as its southern neighbor Colorado, which was also the same as the widths of Washington, Oregon, and the now reduced territory of Dakota. Congress also decided to give Wyoming the same height, four degrees of latitude, as Colorado and the main part of its northern neighbor, Montana. In order to create this nice rectangular territory, Congress lopped off another chunk from the northeastern corner of Utah to give to Wyoming. As we have seen in the previous lectures, with its long-standing bias against Mormons, Congress was never slow to take land away from Utah. With the creation of the Wyoming Territory, the shape of the internal borders of the United States had only one obvious difference from those of today, a still rather large Dakota Territory. Once Wyoming was broken off, the Dakota Territory took on a rectangular shape with a fairly standard seven degrees of width, but with a height of six degrees, which meant that Dakota 
was still large enough to be unwieldy. The awkwardness of this large Dakota territory was exacerbated by regional differences between the northern and southern parts of the territory. The south was more developed and had a larger population, and it was connected by trains to Omaha and Chicago, while the north was linked more directly with Minneapolis, St. Paul. The population in the north began to catch up with that of the south, and in 1883, the capital was moved from Yankton in the south to Bismarck in the north. This naturally inflamed passions in the southern part of Dakota, and citizens there set up an unofficial government for a state of South Dakota in 1885. The tensions in Dakota made it inevitable that the two sections would eventually be brought into the Union as separate states. This finally happened in 1889. With the friction between the two, President Benjamin Harrison did not want to give one state bragging rights over the other, so he shuffled the statehood acts and signed them without looking so no one would know which was the 39th and which the 40th state of the Union. With the division of Dakota into two states in 1889, there was only one major political change that would happen before the Western United States took on the shape which it has today. This change reflected the final death throes of the Indian Territory. As we saw in previous lectures, the 1834 Indian Intercourse Act had established a huge area carved out of what had been the Missouri Territory as unorganized territory set aside solely for the use of Native Americans. At that time, these lands were at the outer edge of the country and considered to be essentially of no use to anyone and so good enough for the Indians. With the acquisition of the Mexican Cession and the formalized establishment of the Oregon Territory, immigrants began to cross this Indian Territory in great numbers, and Anglo-Americans realized that these lands were actually quite fecund and desirable. As a result, in 1854, most of the Indian Territory was reorganized into two new territories of Kansas and Nebraska, resulting in the Indian Territory being greatly reduced to land squeezed between Kansas and Texas. Not all the area between Kansas and Texas was officially part of the Indian Territory, for the famous panhandle sticking out to the west was actually unassigned territory, or as labeled on this map, public land. The panhandle lies south of the 37 degree line of latitude, which was the southern border of the newly created Kansas Territory, north of the 3630 parallel, the northern border of Texas, and west of the 100th meridian. By the Adams-Onis Treaty of 1819, this was outside of the original Louisiana Purchase. As the Indian Intercourse Act applied only to lands within the Louisiana Purchase, this section had not been assigned to Indian Territory in 1834. The Panhandle had actually been part of the lands brought into the country with the Mexican Cession of 1846 and was originally claimed by Texas. In the Compromise of 1850, Texas gave up its claim for these lands as they lay north of the 3630 parallel, for by the Missouri Compromise, Texas could not extend north of that line and retain its status as a slave state. Thus, the Panhandle was unassigned, called the Neutral Strip or No Man's Land, and it had no official government of any sort. The Indian Territory, as reduced by the Kansas Practa Act of 1856, consisted of the rest of the area south of Kansas and north of Texas, with different tribes assigned to different sections. During the Civil War, most of the Native Americans in the Indian Territory sided with the Confederacy. This was both because many Indians felt that they needed to do this for their survival, but also because there was an influ influential group of slave-owning Indians who naturally sided with the South. As a result, in 1862, Congress passed a law that allowed the President to cancel treaties with any tribes which had sided with the Confederacy. In 1866, in a series of so-called Reconstruction Territories, a number of Indian tribes were forced to cede parts of their territory to the federal government. Also in this period, Texas cattlemen 
were driving their herds north to Kansas through the territory, and ranchers were pasturing their animals on Indian lands both with and without permission. Meanwhile, railroads started being built in the territory with the land taken from the Indians and given to the railroad companies. Most of the lands taken from the Indian tribes were in the western part of the territory, and they came to be referred to as unassigned lands or Oklahoma, the latter name coming from a Choctaw phrase which can be translated to mean honored people. Beginning in 1879, these public lands became the focus of demands by Anglo-Americans called boomers who demanded that the government allow them to be settled by non-Native Americans. Initially, the government resisted, but in 1887, the Dawes Act took away land held in common by the tribes and allotted most of it to individual Indians, but retained parts for the potential settlement of non-Natives. Finally, the federal government allowed for the unassigned lands to be made available for settlement by whites on April 22, 1889, resulting in the great land rush of that year with over 50,000 people racing into the region to make land claims. A year later, the Oklahoma Territory was created out of the entire western part of the Indian Territory and also including the Panhandle. The Indian Territory, which was so large when created back in 1834, was now just a small area in the eastern part of today's state of Oklahoma. Reading the writing on the wall, in 1905, the citizens of the Indian Territory tried to gain admission to the Union for a state of Sequoia. However, this was rejected by Congress, which didn't want two new smaller states, especially one which was controlled solely by Native Americans. It is not surprising that prejudice played something of a role in the last political change in the American West, for as we have seen over the course of these lectures, prejudice influenced the shape of the political borders of the American West over and over again. In any case, in 1907, the two territories were joined together and admitted as the state of Oklahoma. This was the final change to the political border transformations of the American West, leaving the internal borders of the continental United States basically as they are today. The political situation wasn't exactly the same as it is today, for in 1907 there were still two small territories, New Mexico and Arizona. These were finally made into states in 1912. This ends our series of YouTube lectures on the shaping of the American West. In this series, we have seen how today's American West went from consisting of three large political entities controlled by foreign powers to being an integral part of the United States consisting of 22 states. The changes that the region went through were largely influenced by economic and political forces. But as we have seen, consistently, there was also the working of the insidious factor of prejudice. One cannot understand the current state of our country without understanding the history of our country. And we hope that this series of lectures will have helped to throw some light on an important part of that history. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch. If you would like to see a selection of original antique maps, please visit our website at pps-west.com.